Let's open our Bibles, please, to the book of Romans, chapter 3, beginning with verse 21. These verses were read earlier. Our theme this morning is God justifies sinners. God justifies sinners. I'll read just a couple of verses as we begin, starting with verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Father, we ask for the ministry of the Spirit of God upon the Word of God and upon our hearts that there would be great works of marvelous grace done in every Christian's heart and in the hearts of those who sit here today without Christ. May this be a day of revelation, Holy Spirit conviction, and life by the grace of God. And we bless you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In recent weeks, as we've stood together, we've been looking at themes from the book of Romans, not taking every single verse, but major themes. And we have seen in chapter 1 that all the Gentiles are sinners. In chapter 2, all the Jews are sinners. In chapter 3, the first 20 verses, the whole world is guilty before God. And the reality is that only when we embrace this biblical truth, only then will we ever value Jesus Christ. If we do not have a sin problem, why would I want to embrace or come to the one who came to earth to deliver his people from their sin? Let me get all of my pronouns in order there. If I do not have a sin problem, why would I have any motivation to come to Jesus Christ who came to deal with my sin problem? You shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. If I love my sin, I will not embrace Jesus who came to destroy my sin. Now, tragically, the truth that I've just shared with you is not only rejected by the masses, but also by many in pulpits. We live in a world where you're not supposed to call names. I opened my New Testament, and I find that people got their names in the Bible Amen. for good reasons and for bad reasons. So it's not a personal vendetta. Uh, what I'll name this morning, you've probably never heard of these people. But the point of it is we have to speak the truth and we have to warn where the issue is salvation. Now, this individual, and we will quote from a message, uh, this whole organization, this whole church and ministry is on this link. Bethel Church in Redding, California is one of the most influential charismatic churches in the country. You say, well, I don't care about that. I'm not charismatic is impacting many people. Eric Johnson, the son of Bill Johnson, who is the main pastor, Eric is one of the pastors, in a sermon entitled, The Joy of Consecration, said, you are not born evil. Every government, every structure, every system, fundamentally and theologically, must start with the concept and the idea that people are good and that they mean to do good. We have to adjust our theology. We have to adjust our perspective of people. We have to realize that people are good and that they mean good. That's common theology. You ask people, most people in America believe they're going to heaven regardless of what they believe. All you have to do to get to heaven is die. People don't have a sin problem. 
Pastors in the largest churches in America do not use the word sin from the pulpit. They say things like, well, people are beaten down with life stresses, so I don't even use the word sin. It's not my calling. I'm called to encourage. Others say I'm not called to proclaim the wrath of God. My calling is to preach love and forgiveness. If God doesn't have any wrath, why would you even be concerned about forgiveness? Out of all this, there's an alarming reality that many professions of faith, the people in America, and probably other parts of the world is true as, as well, people who, who are saying, I'm saved, I'm, I'm baptized, I'm going to heaven, their profession, their belief, or whatever, has left them still married to the world, the flesh, and the devil. In powerful contrast, in glorious contrast, you read in Mark chapter 5, verse 15 through 20, and this wild, demon-possessed man, when he savingly encounters Jesus Christ, immediately he is seated at the feet of Jesus. He's clothed, he's in his right mind, and he's commissioned to go and tell others. In John 4, the society cast out, sin-laden woman at the well, when she encounters Jesus, she's immediately excited to go back to her town and come see a man who's told me all I ever did. And people came into the presence of Jesus because of this new convert. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47, thousands of new converts on the day of Pentecost were transformed by the gospel. And they began to immediately have Bible study and fellowship and break bread at the Lord's table and, and were transformed and went out to tell others, especially when persecution came. They scattered everywhere preaching the gospel. Even the carnal Christians at Corinth, there are some people who really love to think about, to, to bring up the carnal Christians. At, well, I'm saved. Sure, I'm living just like the devil, and, but I'm just a carnal Christian. Well, if you are a genuine carnal Christian, you are of, the such, of such nature as the carnal Christians of Corinth who were radically transformed. You know the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11. He says, if, if, you're, if you're in this lifestyle, and he lists a whole bunch of bad things, some of them are, we would say really bad. He doesn't use the word sodomite, but that's, that's the word, that's the essence. He's talking about those who commit sodomy, those who are adulterers. But he also says those who are covetous. If that's your lifestyle, you will not be in the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, and such were some of you. But you're washed, you're justified, you're in Christ, you're transformed. The charter members of that church had come, pardon me, from the scum of the earth. You know, our kinfolk. For there's no difference. For we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So in Romans 1, 16, where Paul has already told us that he's not ashamed of the gospel, for the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Unto deliverance from your old lifestyle. Unto being, from being dead in sin to being alive in Christ. Unto salvation. Unto being brought out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Unto being saints. Paul had addressed the Corinthians as saints. A saint is any born again Christian. The Spirit of God, when he saves you, makes you a saint. One who is set apart for God's use. Doesn't mean you have a halo. People who have to wait till they die to be, per, to be pronounced by someone else as being a saint, they ain't. That's not the way it's done. The grace of God, by his amazing grace, 
takes you out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. You are a saint set apart for God's use. So when sin comes knocking on your door this week, remind yourself, that's not in the life of Christ, should not be in my life. I'm a saint. I'm set apart for God's use. I have no business looking at that. I have no business going there. I must turn aside from that. Inward motivation by the Holy Spirit. True salvation is real salvation from sin's penalty and from sin's power. Romans 6.16 or 6.14, sin shall no longer have dominion over you. So going forward in Romans chapter 3, we get to verse 21, and he says he saves without the works of the law. We're not saved by working. We're saved by God's own righteousness, by grace, by being, by, uh, being sinners who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in these verses, verse 21 through 28, there are some big words, important words, that reveal some of the miracles relating to salvation. And I think, as many of you know, one of my favorite words is propitiation in verse 25. Even though it's not the first one, we'll begin there, because it's my favorite. <laughs> anyway, I don't know why we're beginning there, but we'll. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. God's holy wrath is satisfied by the sacrifice of Jesus in shedding his blood at Calvary. Propitiation has to do with the satisfying of God's holy wrath. Redemption by the blood. Verse 24. We're going to focus on the word justification. And the uh, reality here is we could picture a God sitting on the throne as judge. And if you or I stand before the Lord, God Almighty, the Heavenly Father, God in heaven. Now, if I'm not born again, he's, he's my creator, but he's not my, earth, he's not my Heavenly Father. But all will stand before him. And those who stand before him without Christ and are guilty face judgment and will go away into punishment. As we come into this world, we are all children of wrath. We're all under the wrath of God. We need a Savior. And so it is the mercy of God that keeps me out of hell one moment longer when I am yet not, when I'm not yet a Christian. Because we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. It's a common word. It means rebellion. A willful rejection of God's word. I know what God's word, but I'm not interested. It means missing the mark. I know the path that God calls for, but I'm going to go elsewhere. Sin is also called transgression. It's crossing over, going beyond the limit that God has set. So what is justification? Justification is a declaration that a believing sinner whose advocate is Jesus Christ is considered to be just in God's sight due to the merits of the blood of Jesus Christ. He does not say, I'm not a sinner. He does not say, I'm acquitted of all charges. If you stand before the judge and he acquits you of all charges, it means that you are falsely accused and you're free to go. In the court of God, we're all found guilty and we are redeemed by the precious blood of Christ and we are propitiated, our sins, are, the wrath is taken care of by what Jesus did at Calvary, and we are justified. We are not only have our, the penalty taken away, but we receive God's righteousness so that God looks upon us through the righteousness of his Son, and he declares us legally righteous and free from punishment because of the merits of the righteousness of Christ. And so here the Jews were, they had been trying to establish their own righteousness 
And this passage is saying, look, you must have righteousness, but God's own righteousness. And in salvation, his righteousness is what is given to you as a believing sinner. Someone has called this grace arithmetic. In redeeming sinners, God subtracts from us our sin and its penalty. And then he adds to us in sin's place the righteousness of Christ. Amen. That's good arithmetic. I was never good in math, but I love that. All of my hope is based on that. And we're dealing with something that is profound and, and uh, how can you get your hand around us or your heart around it or your mind around it? How can God treat unrighteous people as being righteous? What is the source of justification? So in verse 24, he says we are justified freely by God's grace. In other words, we are justified freely by God. No one can justify themselves. Sinners cannot declare themselves or other people to be righteous and pure and holy. And of course, that happens all the time. I'm okay. I'm fine. I don't need anything. What do I need a Savior for? I'm good. I'm a good person. Besides, I'm a preacher. I'm this, I'm that. You don't get to heaven because of you're a preacher. You don't get to heaven because you have a, uh, a plaque that says you haven't missed a Sunday in 500 years. <laughs> Not by works of righteousness which I have done. The blood of Christ must be shed. Sinners cannot declare themselves righteous. Self-righteousness and self-justification self is an impossibility. It is God who justifies. So being justified by grace means that we are also, in verse 24, justified freely. It is God's free gift. It's not something we can earn, not something we can deserve, not something we merit. We get what we don't deserve. We get the opposite of what we deserve. Earlier this week, I deserved blue lights. I deserved a ticket. I deserved a court date. I deserved a fine to the tune of approximately $200. But I was given a gift. Amen. For reasons only known to this officer. He let me go free. I didn't earn it. I didn't deserve it. It was a gift. Now that's peanuts. How can God do this without contradicting his own justice? God is the one who sets the standard of saying that sin must be punished. Well, sin is punished. Amen. God justifies by Christ's own blood. We are justified by propitiation, by Christ's sacrifice of atonement, verse 25, by the redemption that comes by Jesus Christ, verse 24. This means that justification is still, that justice is still carried out. Sin is still punished. Guilt is still dealt with. But not by me, but by Jesus Christ. God's justice was experienced by Jesus Christ. My sin was punished in him. My guilt was borne on him. Justified by his blood means that Jesus has borne the penalty of all of my law-breaking. Now, the Holy Spirit also tells us in chapter 5, verse 1, and in verse 22 of chapter 3, that we're justified by faith. God's grace is the source God's blood is the ground and the means of justification is by faith. Faith is the means by which we are united to Christ. 
Faith is the only means. Without faith, we cannot be justified. And how gracious of God to give faith. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. The word pictures in John chapter 3, where Jesus says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. That word picture was drawn from numbers, and the Lord has sent fiery serpents among the people, and they had poison on the inside, and they were dying. But God had Moses to lift up a serpent, make a fiery serpent, and set on a pole made of brass, a symbol of judgment, and everyone that is bitten when he looks upon it shall live. Amen. Look and live. The problem is on the inside. The solution, the grace provided solution is on the outside. There were probably some people there like there are today who People are dying all around them, and, and so being very sympathetic, and, and so they're, they're trying to nurse them to help and trying to encourage them, but they're still dying. And there are probably some others who are strong and, and had done a lot of exercise and had good weapons, and they're killing snakes left and right. But the poison's on the inside, and they're still dying. And there are probably a lot of people, like there are a lot of people today, and they're looking to their Moses or to their church and they're hoping their hope of salvation is in their church we recently sent out a newsletter in which we showed the the difference between a particular large don, denomination and grace and we did that by means of letting a spokesman for that denomination set forth what he saw as the difference between the way which he proposes and that his church proposes versus the way the Bible proposes. And so we got a call and a dear, dear soul was offended because we had offended her church. It didn't happen to hit her mind that all I was doing was saying, well, here is what your church says, and your church has condemned anybody who does not embrace their church as going to hell, as, as uh, having no hope outside of their church. And you can't get to Jesus except through their church. And so I said, well, that person has spoken truly about their church, and so if that's true, then the opposite is true. When you take the Bible, it presents something different. And you embrace the Bible. You embrace that salvation is by grace through faith through Christ alone. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we can be saved. It's not the name of a church. It's not the denomination. It's Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. Amen. Now, again, I, I don't rejoice. This person has sat under the sound of the gospel. Used to come here and attend here for a brief time. And would say, in my church, we never study the Bible. I love this Sunday school class. You're studying the Bible. I've never done that. She's been active in her church all of her life. Does lots of uh, good works and good deeds. but a blind loyalty to a church rather than to Christ. And there are people, since we're in a church on the outside that says Baptist, there are people who are trusting Baptists to get to heaven. There'll be a lot of Baptists in hell because they never met Jesus. Look and live. Today, the lost sinner who owns his inbred, inward sin, poison of sin, and who looks to Jesus, 
that sinner lives. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Let's speak for a few minutes about some of the positive effects of justification. One is acceptance. God accepts us. He knows we're sinners. He knows we're not worthy to be his children. He knows we, in and of ourselves we're unholy. But he accepts us in the beloved. Ephesians 1, 6. As believing sinners, we are now in Christ, and Christ is in us, and we are clothed in his righteousness. It's interesting how that in modern evangelistic methods we plead for people to come and accept Jesus. And you don't find that in the New Testament. What you find in the New Testament is the cry to face the fact that you are a sinner, you're under the wrath of God, repent, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and he'll accept you. In John 2, verse 18 through 24, uh, verse uh, 22, verse 23 through 24, there are many who believed on him, but he did not commit himself to them because he knew their hearts. The question this morning is not, do I believe in Jesus? But does he believe in me? Because I have come to him as a sinner without hope and without God, and I have no way to get the inward poison out of my soul, and I look to Jesus and Jesus alone and cry out, Oh, Lord God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Amen. Profound simplicity of the gospel. Now, as a redeemed sinner, you may have sin and failure in your life, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, the truth's not in us, we know what it is as believers to grieve the Holy Spirit. But when that happens as a genuine believer, we do have chastening. We're not, we're not any less accepted by the Lord. Our justification never wavers. A Christian sins and there are some... Uh, sensitive souls and oh well I must not be saved well if you say you have no sin then, then you question your salvation but when you sin as a believer you're still loved you're still accepted and so you come boldly to the throne of grace to find help in time of need there is acceptance by the Lord Another gift is that there is holiness, godliness, or sanctification. People who are justified are not only pronounced holy. By the indwelling Holy Spirit, we are progressively being made holy. We are being conformed into the likeness of Christ. Why? How is this true? Because every born-again child of God is now the temple, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Christ now lives within by the Holy Spirit. We are immersed into the realm of the Spirit of God. The born-again child of God is the dwelling place of God. And you are empowered to live the Christian life. You're no longer in bondage to sin. And this is good news. Brace yourself. This is good news. It's not bad news. It's good news. You are a recipient of the chastening hand of God. You say, I didn't think about chastening being good news. Oh, it's very good news. For he says, if you have no chastening, you're an illegitimate. He says, the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastens every son, every daughter whom he receives. Listen very carefully to a saint of years ago who gave this powerful quote by the name of Thomas Brooks. There cannot be a greater evidence of God's hatred and wrath than his refusing to correct men and women or young people from their sinful courses and vanities. Where God refuses to correct or chasten, there God has resolved to destroy. There is no man so near God's acts, so near the flames of hell, as he whom God will not so much as spend a rod upon him. 
Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. In true salvation, the ungodly are not only redeemed and forgiven and forever changed, but we enter into a life of being loved by Jesus on a very practical level. The chastening comes with conviction by the Holy Spirit. The chastening comes with, with uh, an exhortation or, 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 or a rebuke from a brother or a sister or from the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God. Are there other more serious ways if God needs to do that? It's tragic that in the hearts and lives of millions of professing believers in America of whatever stripe, their secret lives are full of iniquity and they have no experience of chastening. They go on scot-free, seemingly. And Jesus will one day say, I never knew you. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. Another effect of, result of justification is confidence. This is really brought out in the chapter 8 of Romans. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Now, this is a rhetorical question, and of course, who will bring any charge? Oh, there are people everywhere, and the, and the, and the enemy of your soul will bring uh, charges everywhere, but the point of it is it won't stand. Because your life is not built on your righteousness. Your life is built on his righteousness. The doing, the dying, the rising of Jesus. So the justified person looks humbly and with confidence for the present and the future and final judgment, having nothing to fear. Oh, glorious redemption. Miraculous justification. The source is God's amazing grace. The ground is the precious blood of Jesus. The means is the gift of faith. And the effects upon your life is acceptance. You're in the family. You're accepted in the beloved. You're joint heirs with God in all things because you're joint heirs with Christ. There is holiness and confidence. The only thing left is amen, hallelujah. What a savior. I think all of this should teach us, all of these verses should teach us, we dare not take sin lightly. God didn't. It required his son going to Calvary to deal with sin. Don't take your sin lightly. I must not take mine lightly. We're sitting here as among believers, and, and there, there are strongholds or areas where we have given ground, or there's some area where, we, where we, we've been bound up and making excuses instead of coming and saying, Oh, Lord God, I've sinned. My attitude was wrong. I have no basis to not forgive. You know, that's a place of wonderful freedom. Oh, uh, how, I don't know how I can ever forgive this person. Really? I mean, I'm an old apostle of bitterness. I understand all this kind of stuff. But for me to say as a Christian, it's so hard to forgive. You know what I'm doing? I am minimizing what Jesus did at Calvary. And I'm minimizing what he did for me. If Jesus had made a decision about redeeming me based on my worthiness, never would have happened. So you love and you bless and you pray for it and you do good and you forgive even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. It's a piece of cake. Jesus did all the hard work. All I have to do, now it's a struggle, it's a battle, but I've got to walk all over my screaming flesh and simply believe God. Amen. And believing God is acting on the word of God. My feelings about this don't matter. Don't you have feelings? Well, believe it or not, I do. They don't matter. 
truth is what matters. You should know the truth and the truth shall set you free. When you embrace the truth and when you tell yourself the truth, you lie to nobody more than you lie to yourself. And you get away with it because there's no one to challenge you. Because you, me, myself, and I are the only ones listening. And we all vote the same way. <laughs> but you never win when you listen to me, myself, and I. That's why Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Take your eyes off your feelings and look away from yourself and behold the Lamb of God. And be renewed in the joy and the rejoicing and the wonder of God's arithmetic. While you are yet a sinner without hope and without God and without reason whatsoever that God would look upon you in kindness. God in his love and mercy looked down and forgave you. He gave you grace to repent. He gave you grace to believe. Blessed be his name. Oh dear Father. May this be a day of rejoicing in justification that comes from God, that comes through Jesus Christ, that takes us out of the kingdom of darkness and places us into the kingdom of God's dear Son, that gives us acceptance before holy God that we can never earn, never deserve, that brings us into the family, it sets us free from all the bondage of sin, self, and Satan. Oh, Father, that sets us free from all the past failures. Sets us free from trying to live based on our performances. Sets us free from trying to walk or crawl our way back to God. To try to feel bad enough about our failures to somehow earn the favor of God. Oh, Lord God, it's all of grace. May this be a day of coming boldly to the throne of grace to find help in time of need for every believer. And those outside of Christ, trusting anything or anyone other than the doing, the dying, the rising of Jesus, may this be a day of looking away from their miserable selves and looking away from the all hope of heaven based on anything other than Jesus and look away and behold the Lamb of God. From a heart full of sin that cannot save itself. And cry out with that wonderful publican of old, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you still hear that prayer. And for this we pray and give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing and obey the Lord. As